Uh, greetings again. This is uh, Dr. Matthew Andrews. We're going to be discussing ankle impingement. Um, this is a uh, relatively unique topic and I think something that's probably a little bit uh, underlooked and possibly undertreated uh, just because it can manifest itself uh, as some uh, other pathologic uh, processes as well. But um, nonetheless, relatively common. Um, sometimes it's a surgical problem. Sometimes it you know, is uh, appropriately resolved with uh, conservative management, uh, but definitely something that we see uh, quite a bit of. Uh, so We'll dive right in again. Um, of course, this is uh, uh, me again. Um, been involved with residency education, been uh, here in Southeast Michigan now for over a decade. Um, no, contra no conflict of interest to declare for this lecture. Um, this lecture does feature some uh, products, however, nothing that I am uh, currently compensated for. Um, I do consider myself to be an accomplished arthroscopist. Um, however, I have zero formal arthroscopy training. I've never gone to a scopes course. Uh, I just had a lot of experience as a resident uh, where I probably did just as many knee scopes as ankle scopes. And I've just uh, uh, something that we've really you know, developed um, appropriate technique. And then we, of course, train our residents relatively heavily. And to this day, um, ankle arthroscopy by volume is probably in the top three of procedures that I do. Um, we, uh, of course, with other ancillary procedures like ankle stabilization, um, fracture reduction and uh, management of OCDs, things like that. So objectives today, um, we're going to talk a little bit about the pathogenesis of ankle impingement, and we're going to discuss a few case examples. Um, and then also we'll get into a little bit of surgical technique as well. And this does uh, favor arthroscopy as opposed to open procedures. However, anything that we do from an arthroscopic standpoint can also uh, be done open as well, uh, should it be necessary. Um, <clears throat> so uh, impingement is primarily anterior. However, posterior impingement can occur in some very specific instances, which we'll uh, uh, discuss an example of. Um, and then also, uh, you know, how do we treat this? What, what are our options as far as, you know, how we manage ankle impingement, um, whether as a primary pathology or secondary to another process? So, so how does this present? How do these people come into the office? They generally have uh, capsulitis of the ankle. They've got some diffuse pain um, involved in the joint. They generally have pain with motion. Typically, end range motion tends to be more of an irritant. Um, this can masquerade a little bit. Sometimes this may um, be more of a presentation of anterolateral, like you may consider it to be like a sinus tarsitis type of pain, particularly if your patient has a significant uh, pronatory uh, motion of the rear foot uh, during gait. Um, and it can also present itself as dorsal nerve irritation. People will complain of uh, tingling over the top of their foot that radiates into their toes. And if that's the case, and it's, it's sort of uniform, um, across the top of the foot, it's, it's usually a proximal impingement somewhere. And you can have impingements of the dorsal cutaneous nerves either at the um, anterolateral lower leg uh, where the superficial um, perineal nerve becomes cutaneous in that space and uh, becomes sensory over the top of the foot. Uh, or you can have impingement uh, either under the inferior or superior extensor retinacula or the ankle joint itself. And oftentimes uh, when you have that dorsal nerve impingement, uh, one of the first things I'll do is I'll inject the ankle just to see if the ankle joint is uh, a component of that. And in many cases, it does significantly uh, reduce uh, that dorsal nerve irritation. So uh, a little bit of a, a kind of a wide uh, pathogenesis as far as uh, how these people will come into your office. But the, of course, the unifying factor is pain uh, because this is a mechanical problem. It's a mechanical impingement. So anterior impingement uh, is generally anything that's going to restrict your range of motion or anything that causes pain at the end range of motion with this. Um, soft tissue impingement is the most common, of course, but uh, osseous impingement does also occur, particularly in the context of arthritic deformities, post-traumatic deformities, um, or even some other uh, structural problems that can be associated, particularly the anterior ankle. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll kind of give a, uh, a little brief a bit of all this stuff. Um, we talked about dorsal nerve pain. Instability is another issue as well. Sometimes if you've got a history of, of inversion sprains uh, or some other mechanical derangement of the actual joint, you can get some instability and you can have some gait changes associated with that, such as like a widened base of gait or shortened stride length. Um, you can also have, uh, of course, capsulitis or inflammation of the joint, which is very common. Um, and then instability is uh, uh, probably more of a concerning thing. And that's one of the things that I discuss with a lot of our ankle instability patients is, you know, yeah, this is a problem now and you may have an issue with your ankle going out on you uh, and you know it's a stability issue now but what's it going to be in 10 years what's it going to be in 20 years if we don't do anything about it you know is it worthwhile to consider more aggressive management now so as not to worry about it down the road uh, is is bracing appropriate um, are stabilization procedures appropriate um, you know things of that nature so um, there are some associated pathologies with this as well sometimes even like some focal soft tissue impingements in the cases of trauma like you can have interposition of uh, the uh, tibialis anterior or tibialis posterior tendons uh, within uh, the joint capsule itself in the context of previous ankle fractures, things like that. 
So this is a little bit of a map of the, those dorsal cutaneous nerves as they come over the top of the foot. So uh, on this right diagram, this kind of shows like a, a loose uh, representation of what these uh, extensor retinaculum look like. So when you have a pinch point of those dorsal cutaneous nerves, or you have that anterior impingement, it's likely one of three things. It's likely uh, either one of the, um, uh, the retinaculum uh, or possibly the, the capsule of the joint itself. Uh, with a, a special mention too to midfoot arthritis, um, which I discussed in my, my, uh, my other uh, presentation on pescavus, where you can have some dorsal nerve irritation just associated with midfoot capsulitis, but this is by far much more common. So you'll have um, pinch points along the retinaculum or within the joint itself, and oftentimes the, the joint itself is a good first place to look. People will complain of that dorsal nerve pain. I've got burning tingling over the top of my foot. It radiates into my toes, and it's and it's not uniform, so it may follow a specific uh, cutaneous nerve distribution, but generally the culprit is this inferior extensor retinaculum or the joint. So if you inject underneath that, um, oftentimes patients will get almost immediate uh, significant relief, and that's essentially diagnostic of um, anterior impingement involving the retinaculum. So the, the joint itself, uh, soft tissue impingement is uh, relatively common and it's, uh, it shows up in an MRI. And I've got a couple of MRI slides to, to, to kind of really highlight this. Um, of course, this is just a cross section um, of a cadaver model that shows what a lot of this stuff looks like. So you've got uh, this big plug of soft tissue sitting in the front of the joint. And now that I kind of point this out, uh, it'll become a lot more visible in MRI. And I think um, when we consider arthroscopy of the joint, we you know, generally will consider the, the density and uh, any kind of abnormal appearance of this anterior uh, soft tissue within the ankle joint capsule uh, when we're concerning ourselves with the debridement. Uh, so this is what that looks like on, on, a, uh, on an MRI. So we have, uh, you can see the picture on the left here, you have this, this kind of invagination or this infolding of tissue. This isn't the greatest MRI slice to show, but this does show that plug of tissue that's sitting there. And you can see that small projection that kind of folds into the joint anteriorly. When people will have like a snap, crackle, pop of the joint, this is usually what that is. This is usually that um, impingement, that, that capsular structure that's getting stuck. And you can see on the right here, uh, this is a... Um, uh, axial slice right through the joint surface, right on the dorsal talus, where you can see that infolding uh, of all uh, of this uh, soft tissue impingement in the front of the ankle joint with a little bit of fluid around it as well. So these are relatively easy to pick out on an MRI, particularly a sagittal MRI. So when I evaluate an MRI, I'll generally look at the uh, a sagittal stir image or a water weight image just to help kind of uh, help us focus on the pathology. And for most things that we're sending for MRI for, whether it's uh, Achilles tendinopathy, plantar fascia, um, ankle joint, the, the, uh, the sagittal is usually a good place to start. We get a kind of a good picture of what's actually going on with regards to uh, soft tissue impingement uh, involving the joint itself. On a scope, this is what that stuff looks like. It's going to look like uh, you know, a bunch of scarring within the joint. So the soft tissue structures that you'll see in the anterior ankle, you'll generally see a lot of synovial tissue, which is that, that uh, yellowish soap bubble type appearance. Um, which may or may not be hemorrhagic, it uh, may or may not have a inflammatory component, but you'll also see these bands of tissue, and this is just dense irregular connective tissue, so essentially scarring uh, that will visualize in the front of the joint. And this is a very uh, easy target typically to go after uh, with a scope and a shaver to be able to debride and remove a lot of this tissue uh, away from the joint. And just be by the action of physically removing this, you'll generally increase range of motion, decrease anterior impingement, um, and, and increase functionality of the joint. So for chronic uh, inflammation of joints and we get into the scope, oftentimes this is exactly what we're looking at is just this big plug of tissue that we see in here. Um, here's another example. This is actually some uh, synovial tissue uh, that uh, these pictures don't come through the greatest, but you can see, especially this one on the right, you see a little bit of red streaking uh, within the synovium. And that's an, uh, an inflamed or a hemorrhagic uh, synovial tissue. And we're generally well within our rights to debride a lot of that. This picture on the left here, again, is a lot of anterior impingement. So you look at the nine o'clock position, we see the uh, anterior edge of the distal tibia. And at the, of course, on the bottom here, we see the uh, curvature of the dome of the talus. And then anteriorly, we just see like a large plug of, of um, like a mass of tissue that's irregular. It's unorganized. Most of this stuff can be safely debrided uh, without a second thought, um, which will significantly improve functionality of the joint and, uh, of course, decrease pain as well. Um, a couple other uh, anterior impingement things that we'll see. I wanted to uh, kind of pay a little bit of lip service to uh, uh, PVNS or pigmented villanodular synovitis. This is a, uh, a unique pathology um, that we'll see every once in a while, and it's not generally seen in joints so much as we'll see it involved with tendons um, or other structures. So PVNS 
is uh, histologically uh, nearly identical to a giant cell tumor. So when we see it in a tendon sheath, we literally just call it giant cell tumor of a tendon sheath, even though the histology and um, characteristics of these lesions is generally the same. So this is a uh, fat weighted image where we see this, this uh, large loculated um, mass sitting right in the front of the ankle that will cause some anterior impingement. Uh, these are fluidic in density, and when you when you go after these with a scope, generally you'll see like a much more of a reddish brownish hemorrhagic synovium. So PVNS is pretty easy to pick out. Um, I have removed these from tendon sheets as well. Uh, this is something that we do see, you know, periodically, but it's something to keep in the back of your mind as a potential differential diagnosis whenever you have an anterior impingement, particularly if there's a mass. Now, just based upon the appearance of this MRI, this is not likely something that may have shown up on an X-ray. Um, however, sometimes you can see, um, you know, some focal thickening. Um, especially on a sagittal view of the anterior uh, soft tissue envelope of the ankle that can sometimes lead you in the direction of diagnosis here. Uh, but a diagnostic tap of the joint would be a much better modality to help um, uh, define and uh, diagnose uh, PBNS. Um, another thing that I've seen relatively recently uh, as well is this uh, phenomenon called synovial chondromatosis, which is not super common, uh, but oftentimes it, it is associated with a, with a post-traumatic um, issue, and it generally tends to affect larger weight-bearing joints. Uh, the etiology of this is really unclear. How does, does this actually start? We're not quite certain, but what happens is you develop these little cartilage balls within the joint. The, the, the proposed etiology of this is that you have some shearing of cartilage or you have synovial hypoproliferation that will undergo like a tissue transformation to cartilages, uh, cartilaginous tissue. And these things don't really show up on an X-ray. You might see a little bit of shadowing of it because it's a cartilage density, um, whereas on an MRI, it usually shows up clear as day. And I've oftentimes sent people, um, particularly if they have like a, a block, if they have like a, 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 a dorsal impingement with uh, like a specific pinch point or they feel something shifting or moving around, um, oftentimes uh, on an MRI, one of the very first things I'll do is we'll refer for an MRI exam because we're looking for this. I'm looking for synovial chondromatosis. Uh, so you're looking for these little cartilage balls that are within the joint. And this is what they look like. They're actually pretty, um, uh, some of them can be quite large and some of them may actually require like a mini open arthrotomy or something like that to go after. But a lot of these you can grab with a pituitary ronge or a pituitary forceps or something to be able to um, just grab onto these things and physically debride them because they're basically like marbles that, within the joints. They're large cartilage balls. Um, we literally just go after them, debride them, and pull them all out. There is a small risk of recurrence, um, but they're nothing that's that's of any concern. You know, there, there's no concern for malignancy or um, any other sinister process. Um, however, these things are definitely a physical uh, impingement and a significant irritant within the joint. So. Uh, excision is, is largely curative. Um, we'll uh, shift gears a little bit now and talk a little bit more, more about osseous impingement as well. Uh, this is a pretty straightforward uh, topic where you just have a structural limitation of dorsiflexion. So whether it's a uh, equinus type scenario, if it's an osseous equinus type scenario, uh, whether it's a, a post-traumatic arthritis, um, pigmented, pigmented villonodular synovitis can cause osseous impingement. Um, but this is a, a little bit more clearly defined because we can readily see it on an x-ray. And you'll see that anterior lipping of the anterior distal tibia, or you'll see uh, possibly some uh, a concomitant lesion as well within the dorsal uh, neck of the uh, uh, talus or that interface right where the uh, cartilage runs out of the uh, anterior talar dome uh, into the neck. So you'll see some physical impingement there. You'll see some bony structural changes, uh, which is essentially, you know, diagnostics, you know, um, but the presentation is largely the same. People will have impingement type pain. I can't move my ankle past a certain uh, range of motion or, you know, I took up running, uh, but I'm having a hard time with, with you know, range of motion issues with the ankle and it's really swelling on me. So things like that, um, you know, pretty straightforward presentation here. Um, and then, of course, initial management is usually pretty straightforward as well with things like injections or bracing. Um, uh, or, you know, sometimes we just, you know, discuss surgical options right away, kind of depending on severity and ideology. Um, so CT is a good study as well, uh, you know, to get for these. Um, you can see here, you know, really just a, a, a mix of uh, both issues here where you have that dorsal spring on the talus and some anterior spring on the tibia. Um, I don't routinely will send for, for CT for these, but I will send for an MRI because sometimes you're surprised where you have a patient that has a, um, like a, 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 an anterior impingement or at least they have symptoms consistent with that. Maybe you gave them a, a joint injection, um, you know, where, they, where they've got capsulitis of the joint and you're trying to control for inflammation. 
but sometimes you'd be surprised. And MRIs are a great study, particularly for any kind of, of uh, uh, perioperative workup, because sometimes you you see things like AVN or the talus, or, or you see uh, occult fractures, uh, which is uh, something I saw recently, which was a, a missed Taylor neck fracture uh, that was really kind of presenting itself as an impingement uh, scenario. Uh, so you do, uh, you know, of course, do your due diligence. Make sure that you know exactly what you're going after before you go after it. So um, you can make the case that an arthroscopic exam is, uh, can be largely diagnostic just as well as it can be therapeutic. But know what you're going after. So make sure you MRI all these patients and have a good uh, idea of, of what you're looking at um, before you just go chasing, you know, an, an anterior spur. Treatment of these is pretty straightforward for osseous lesions. Um, resection is uh, generally curative. Uh, whether you, uh, you do just a, a straightforward um, arthroplasty of the joint. Um, bracing can sometimes be beneficial. Um, I generally do not recommend physical therapy for any of these kind of structural problems, uh, just because that can somewhat worsen it. You know, all, all you're doing is causing your patients uh, an increase in uh, capsulitis and discomfort. And, the, you know, there are some physical therapy modalities that are specific for pain management uh, that are always beneficial, like therapeutic ultrasound, uh, electrical stimulation, iontophoresis, things like that. Um, even general stretching may be you know, somewhat appropriate, but for the most part, because these are structural problems, I don't really recommend any kind of aggressive uh, uh, physical therapy, uh, really just to avoid causing your patient's pain, because it's not going to fix the problem. I mean, all you're trying to do is really alleviate uh, pain or, or palliate these things, but uh, really all you're doing is just causing chronic inflammation in those, in those instances. Um, and I, I will kind of briefly mention here, because these are structural problems within the joint, you may also want to consider more aggressive options such as arthrodesis of the joint or uh, ankle arthroplasty with implant, which are uh, appropriate options as well. Um, I have been referred um, ankles for scopes where I take x-rays of it and I say, you know, this isn't even worthwhile even attempting to scope because this is just a pure arthritis scenario. You'd be much better off with a uh, joint replacement as opposed to, you know, uh, doing a scope because a scope would be largely a, a futile endeavor. There's really nothing that we're going to accomplish, um, you know, with it just because the joint is in such bad shape. So, uh, so essentially, just make sure that you know what your what your options are with regards to treatment of this and whether or not it becomes a more uh, aggressive management problem as opposed to just doing a, an arthroscopic procedure or a simple um, arthroplasty of the joint. Posterior impingement is not uh, as common uh, of a thing, and oftentimes posterior impingement may not be a true impingement. It may just be a pathology associated with uh, FHL tenosynovitis. Um, the FHL tendon does communicate with the posterior ankle in about 17% uh, of um, normal feet. Uh, so keep in mind too that you, you may just have FHL tendonitis that's kind of masquerading as uh, posterior impingement. So if you have somebody who's at risk for FHL tendonitis, such as soccer players, dancers, um, anybody who's doing aggressive uh, pointing with the foot, uh, sometimes even like a uh, lateral motion like basketball players or tennis players will get some FHL tendonitis. Um, but oftentimes, you know, make sure that you know that it's an impingement problem and you're not just looking at an FHL uh, issue. Um, and then, of course, posterior impingement is probably underdiagnosed as well, uh, whether it's a contracture type issue, uh, which can occur, uh, particularly in the context of equinus or anything that will cause equinus, like post stroke scenarios, cerebral palsy, things like that. These are things where you're going to have uh, uh, tightness of the posterior capsule and limitation of ankle joint range of motion. Um, however, we just call it Aquinas generally, but sometimes Aquinas is uh, really a pathologic just because you do have some uh, posterior impingement that's going on. Uh, but post-traumatic is probably the most uh, common one that we see. So this is just an example of somebody who has like a, a posterior lipping um, of the tibia, but things like uh, uh, pylon uh, type injuries where you don't necessarily uh, fix the posterior fragment. Sometimes those can uh, cause some impingement problems down the road. But generally, the, the patient's history and clinical presentation will tell you uh, much more of the story as, as far as how to appropriately manage it. Um, this is a case that we did just about two weeks ago at McLaren um, as of the, the time of this recording. Um, this is a patient who had a shepherd's fracture about four months ago and is, uh, went through physical therapy and everything uh, through her primary care doctor before being uh, referred to us. And it was, uh, you know, undiagnosed. Essentially, the uh, initial x-rays that she had in urgent care said there was no fracture or nothing. Um, so we uh, sent her for an MRI, and it turns out she had a lot of uh, fluid collection around this uh, posterior aspect of the talus. And I said, this was, you know, more than likely a, uh, you know, a shepherd's fracture where you just sheared off that uh, posterior process based upon the uh, clinical history um, and the injury that the patient sustained. Uh, so we literally just go through a posterior lateral incision, just go right at these fragments and just debride it. So we did that at McLaren probably about um, two weeks ago. It should be probably about a month um, as of the time that, that, the, that this uh, conference is taking place. So uh, one of the more common reasons for uh, uh, posterior impingement is either that 
uh, posterior process of the talus or an actual shepherd's fracture itself, which is uh, oftentimes an underdiagnosed injury. So impingement treatment is pretty straightforward. Um, injections is always going to be a great first line thing to do for an impingement type pain. With uh, um, injections into the joint, I generally will use uh, water-soluble steroids like dexamethasone. Um, I just use one of dex and, and, and two of lidocaine or two of marcaine um, right into the joint, um, either through uh, anteromedial or anterolateral, much the same as like your arthroscopic portals. Um, the benefits of it is you're going to get a potent anti-inflammatory medication into the joint at the site of pathology, and it largely stays there. So systemic absorption is not um, uh, clinically significant for people that have joint pathologies. Uh, and then also you get a little bit of uh, increase in the joint space. Uh, so uh, as a corollary, um, in knees and hips and shoulders, we can do uh, hyaluronic acid injections like Suparts and Synvisc and OrthoVisc and some of these uh, chicken fat injections that, you, that your patients will call them. Um, that's not FDA indicated for the ankle joint. Um, however, some people have done some lim limited studies on that. Um, but one of the benefits to those types of things is you're really just kind of increasing that joint space a little bit. Um, and even though you're injecting fluid into the joint and increasing the, the, the fluid pressure and the hydrostatic pressure within the joint, you get a little bit of uh, decompression of it. And sometimes that can be quite beneficial. So it, uh, in our practice, um, injections for uh, impingement is generally the first line of treatment for this. And sometimes we'll even pulse it as a, a sequence of three injections. Or I've got some patients that I'll just say, you know what, whenever this bothers you, you know, come back and see us. We'll do another injection here or there. Um, it works great. Uh, and we've had you know, great success with that really just as a, uh, a singular therapy. Um, I put question marks after physical therapy and immobilization here for kind of specific reasons. Um, physical therapy, like we discussed before, um, if it's a structural problem, uh, oftentimes physical therapy is it can be detrimental. And really all you're doing is causing more pain to your patient and you're really not you know, appropriately treating the pathology. And immobilization, um, I, I put a question mark by as well, just because when you immobilize uh, a joint that has a lot of anterior impingement, all you're doing is you're kind of promoting deposition of scar tissue. Uh, so uh, once that patient starts walking without the boot, you're going to have a lot more scar tissue to try to uh, break up and, and, and try to deal with. So mobilization, uh, we can use selectively, or obviously if there's some other sort of uh, osteostructural problem, um, stress fractures and whatnot, uh, that may be appropriate. But for the most part, we try to maintain motion uh, wherever it's appropriate, um, particularly in the case of soft tissue impingement, just because you do run that risk of having... Um, pathologic changes associated with, with uh, immobilization. Medications can sometimes be beneficial, uh, whether it's NSAID medications uh, or uh, uh, steroids, uh, just for uh, anti-inflammatory effect. Um, that uh, dorsal nerve impingement, I've had very, very good success with use of topical compound medications. Uh, so there's a, a couple local um, uh, pharmacies that will do topical compounds uh, for us, and they send out their order forms to everybody, um, uh, you know, to all of our offices. And uh, they're probably sponsors of this uh, great conference as well, just because they've been great partners for podiatry, um, uh, particularly in, in, uh, in my world in Southeast Michigan. Um, these medications work very, very well. So if you've got uh, people that have obscure nerve issues, particularly like dorsal cutaneous nerves, somebody has a weirdo like medial dorsal cutaneous nerve pain, the topicals work great. Uh, you know, topical medications that contain like gabapentin plus diclofenac plus possibly uh, ketamine, lidocaine, things like that. Um, these, these things work fabulous. Um, it, sometimes it's real hit or miss. Some people will have profound relief with it. Some people will have uh, kind of negligible effects. Um, sometimes uh, MLS laser treatments, if you have that available uh, to your practice or can refer somebody, that can be beneficial for uh, dorsal nerve irritation as well. We've had good success with that in our practice. Uh, and then, of course, the uh, definitive management is really just debridement. Uh, be able to remove um, a lot of this, this tissue from the front of the joint. And this is where arthroscopy really uh, is uh, uh, a great asset uh, in our practice. And then for our patients, you know, just to be able to uh, physically remove a lot of that impinging tissue with good results. And I'm pretty aggressive about rehab for a lot of these things. If, I didn't, if I'm doing a straightforward ankle scope, you can walk in and walk right out. I just, you know, I'll probably put you into a surgical shoe with a, with a bulky dressing for a couple of days. But beyond that, unless we're doing ancillary procedures like an ankle stabilization or a tendon repair, um, I generally don't keep people off these at all. Um, and even uh, nowadays with some of the newer techniques that we're using with soft tissue anchors for a brostrum type repair, I generally will uh, walk people on a boot um, almost immediately um, after uh, some of these procedures uh, just because our repairs are strong. So really all we're trying to do is, is support incisional healing. Um, and then, of course, you know, promote early rehab, early weight bearing, just because the functional results uh, with early weight bearing after a lot of these procedures are um, much more beneficial with early weight bearing. 
Um, so I'll talk a little bit about some uh, emerging treatment as well. And this is a, kind of an area of special interest to me because I do have some uh, active research here. Um, we also have some uh, case studies that have been submitted for publication as well. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a specific product uh, that is a um, umbilical uh, sourced amnion graft that's a living cell therapy graft that contains a high amount of hyaluronic acid. So I mentioned before that, that we have HA products that are uh, available in the, in the orthopedic space. However, there's no indication for ankle use. Uh, whereas, uh, um, and even though the ankle is a semi-constrained joint and goes through much less of a range of motion than say the knee, um, it, it still receives an axial stress and the force per unit area is much higher. So if you can do anything to increase hyaluronic acid within the ankle joint, um, that's, you know, theoretically you should have some uh, relief um, with those modalities. Now there's been a couple limited studies uh, with use of hyaluronic acid injections, but the problem is it's considered off-label use just because it's um, not FDA uh, indicated for use in the ankle joint. So we came up with a better idea. So we've got these uh, umbilical amnion grafts and this is a uh, arthroscopic administration of this graft. So we, we scope the joint and because this graft is a little bit thicker, a little bit more robust, this is a, a smaller sized uh, one of these grafts and it, it's a little bit thicker and this is uh, essentially an instrument passed all the way through the ankle joint. So this is a some sort of a grabber or a pituitary forceps or something uh, where we grab onto that that uh, graft and we uh, make a, a little bit of an increase in our incision size. We literally just pull the whole thing through and, and lay it right in the front of the ankle joint. So on a scope, this is what it actually looks like. So you can see the dome of the talus right here and you can see that graft kind of interposed within the ankle joint. These grafts will hydrolyze and um, uh, will degrade a little bit, but they, they leave their components behind. So they have um, a defined uh, population of mesenchymal stem cells. Uh, they've got hyaluronic acid, which is the um, umbilical component. Um, and they uh, also have a lot of growth factors um, and uh, a pretty significant anti-inflammatory uh, character. So we were initially using these graphs for, uh, uh, in the uh, wound space and advanced wound management, um, but also for wrapping of tendons and things like that. Um, I've kind of gotten a little bit away from uh, doing tendon wraps of these graphs just because they are a little, a little bit more robust and they do take up a little bit more space. I will generally use the thinner um, uh, amnion graphs or other structural graphs such as an extracellular matrix graphs for tendon augmentation wherever it's appropriate. Um, however, uh, this is a kind of a unique product that does have that uh, population of the hyaluronic acid. So here again, this is the, the graft interposed in the joint. You can see the anterior edge of the distal tibia here. And the graft itself uh, just kind of wrapped around in the, the front of the ankle joint. And these things do kind of process and your body will hydrolyze them over a period of a few days. Um, so with these, uh, we did a case series on uh, use of these uh, grafts within the ankle joint. We, do have, uh, we have 26 patients that were enrolled and we were tracking uh, visual analog scores and AOFAS hind foot and ankle scores at um, uh, two weeks, four weeks, uh, three, six, and 12 months after uh, the, uh, the procedure with regards to their uh, functional outcome scores with, with pretty strikingly good results. Um, this was something we had actually initially submitted for publication, but the, the company that um, marketed these graphs was Osiris Therapeutics and they were bought by Smith & Nephew in the middle of it. So Smith & Nephew being of course a much larger organization, uh, we have to go through a little bit more rigmarole with regards to getting our data published and we have to work with their um, uh, PhD, uh, you know, research nerds uh, to, uh, you know, try to get our, our, our stuff uh, appropriately available for publication. Um, we also have a, a case study on a patient that had uh, MRIs pre and 90 days post uh, with use of these graphs with uh, uh, treatment of an osteochondral lesion of the talus uh, that had you know, very good results. And we also had a very rare uh, opportunity to do a bilateral ankle scope on a younger patient with psoriatic arthritis and uh, we blinded him. I said, I'm going to put the, uh, this graft into one of your uh, ankles and I want you to try to figure out which one it was. So he um, um, uh, obviously doesn't have an objective way to you know, determine it, but, I, you know, but he told me a couple of weeks after the procedure, I'm like, I think you put it in my left ankle because I feel like it glides a lot better and I feel like I have a lot better range of motion with it. And it, I think it healed up a little bit faster than the right. And he was absolutely correct. And that was the, the ankle that we used it, which was actually the worst of the two. Uh, so that's, uh, and I just realized here that I spelled arthroscopy wrong in the bottom. I apologize for my lack of proofreading here. Um, <clears throat> so that's some stuff that we've got coming down the pipe and, and why uh, uh, ankle impingement is, is uh, kind of a particular interest to me. Uh, so um, again, uh, you know, thank you everybody for your time. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, thank you to the Michigan Podiatric Medical Association. I think uh, I'm, I'm excited to see the format for this conference this year uh, with a combination of a couple virtual days um, and then in person. Uh, so. I uh, will see you hopefully all in Dearborn.